My name is Bernard Ashwanden. At Publishing Smarter, one of the things we do is create videos like this one to help people learn how to improve their documentation creation, management, and publishing workflow. This video is going to show you how to work with DITA, specifically some of the syntax and common elements that are used in the DITA environment, and there will be a few examples of these put into practice. For those of you who are taking notes along the way, I want you to remember a couple of things. Not all of the slides or the topics are going to carry equal weight, so feel free to use what you can and discard the rest. The slides are a reference, largely for my convenience to keep me on topic, so we may go quickly. Normally, in a live environment or through a webinar, I'd suggest that if you have questions, just ask as they come up, but we can't do that with the recording. Instead, I definitely recommend that you take any questions that you have and email them to me. My email address is at the end of the presentation. Also, if you are taking notes, just look in the bottom corner and note the slide number. It makes it a little easier for you to review your notes afterwards and know exactly what section you happen to be talking about. With the recorded video, you can also note the timestamp. So if you keep track of how many minutes or seconds you're into the presentation, that can help. And lastly, while I'd love to claim that any of the mistakes that you find are in there on purpose, they isn't, ain't, and weren't never. Let me know if you find things that are incorrect in the slides and I'll fix them as I can in my source materials. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bernard Ashwanden and I'm the president of the company called Publishing Smarter. I've been doing work in documentation and training since about 1992, and I act as a consultant and a trainer in content management systems, XML, DITA, and other publishing technologies. I'm also involved with the STC. I'm on the board of directors and continue to do work in local communities. Aside from putting together videos like this one, some of the things that we do at Publishing Smarter include help clients improve their content creation, management, and distribution workflow. We do this in a few ways, primarily through content analysis, legacy file conversion, related training, and any of the support that you might need. The main goals we have are to help you reduce your overall production costs, improve the document quality, and increase the employee productivity. For people who are taking an entire course, these learning objectives are touched on all the way through from start to end. In this video, we're only touching on a few pieces. But normally, I'd like to get people to the point where they can identify the XML tagging and the syntax and how it works in the world of DITA, and what the DITA specification says and what the core elements are that people would use, generally speaking, day to day. I get people comfortable with creating topic, reference, concepts, and tasks, and then taking those standalone pieces and using them as part of a map document. So you actually build a map which is sort of like a consolidated document that pulls together several independent pieces of information. I also give you the chance to work with different software tools, and that could be FrameMaker from Adobe, it could be XMetal from Just Systems, it could be the Oxygen XML tool, XML Spy, whatever the tools are that are out there, there's a lot of them available that let you build DITA content. All of the content that people build, I collect, I take that content, and I run through the DITA toolkit. What this allows you to do is see the conversion of the data source material into things like PDF and HTML so that you get an idea of what's possible. And lastly, I also touch on some of the key issues that should be considered whenever anyone decides that they want to implement data or convert any of their legacy content. The disclaimer is a bit of a fun one. In order to keep this brief, I'm going to make blanket statements about data to keep things simple. That means that I'm not going to be giving you 100% perfect purist data but I'll stay as close as I can. Some purists may not like this and I get in trouble from them. In some cases, this is just wrong of them. I'm right, they're not. Of course, they also make valid points. So here's the goal. I wanna teach you about DITA, not teach DITA. I don't need you to learn every single element, every detail of the specification forward and back. The difference between those two, it's a little bit like learning to drive in a controlled environment and not starting off right away on the freeway. In that controlled environment, there's fewer things that you have to think about. You can focus on those baby steps on the early parts of getting the car to move, of getting familiar with the brakes, of getting familiar with how to turn and steer left and right and bring it to a full stop and go. Over time, the goal is to get up to the point where you can independently drive on the freeway. And sure, I want you to be able to work with DITA. But early on in these initial presentations, I want you to figure out big picture ideas, get comfortable with them, and then be able to evolve your skill set. 
I have seven different sessions that I've put together in order to work through DITA. Here, however, we're only looking at session two. In this session, I want you to get familiar with some of the core elements of DITA, getting comfortable with topic, concept, task, reference, maps, some of the elements that you'd be working with every single day, like paragraphs, tables, what they are, what they mean. And I also want to show you a couple of very, very initial samples of some of these elements in use. Here I want to start off with the idea of recapping session one. It's going to be relatively quick. It's not nearly as detailed, but it gives you an idea of what was in the first session just to reset your memory or if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet to give you an idea of what's discussed in it. Then I want to show you how to write in the DITA world, some of the core elements that people would work with. That relates really to the task, concept, reference, the topics that exist. I also want to talk a little bit about how to build outlines and how to develop some basic content based on what's covered in the earlier slides. By way of introduction, let me begin by recapping the three main sections that were explored in the first session. Initially, the conversation was a little bit about structure and how the structure can benefit your authoring environment. I explained what I mean by structured authoring, some of the reasons you may want to care, ways that you can save time and money and effort. We also looked a little bit at under the hood, some of the code examples, the benefits of structure, a review of document and how it would be done, and some ideas to consider moving forward. Then I moved ahead to structure and DITA specifically, some of the core benefits of that environment. What's the purpose of DITA? Why it should matter to you? I tried to summarize it into a single slide and talked about the core ideas of DITA being the map or the book map to organize your information, the rel table for linking, the topics which we're going to explore in a lot more detail today, and then specializations. I also mentioned that behind the scenes, there's a lot of attributes. And I gave you a couple of reasons that DITA is better than do it yourself, than build your own environment from scratch. In order to help you get your head around things, I tried to visualize the process in a few different ways to show you one approach to how DITA might end up working. So I planned a bit of a collection of topics, assigned the topic types, built a map, planned out a relationship table, and then began to create content with title and short description. You also have a chance to see some of the sample output. Now, I didn't get to do that in the previous video that's of the same general duration as this one, but I do have a couple of different videos that show you exactly how to go through and create content and build sample output. I also wanted you to consider some of the additional features of DITA. So one of the pieces was different conditions so that there were examples that would deliver content to different audiences so that an administrator might see how to delete content, whereas a day-to-day -day user doesn't necessarily see that same info. On to the new stuff, writing DITA, some of the core elements that you should focus on when you get started as a writer in the DITA world. There's a couple of key starting points for writers. Day-to-day, -day, it's likely that you're going to create tasks, concepts, and references. Each of these is a unique topic type. The task is the procedural detail, that's step-by-step, -step, the concept is the background information. The reference is the quick access to the facts. And a topic is any meaningful standalone unit of information that's minimalist and well-written. Usually the task, the concept, the reference. And also remember along the way, there are attributes, that's background information to further define elements. Let's explore this in a little more detail and with a couple of examples moving forward. A topic can be any meaningful standalone unit of information. So as an example, I may decide that I want to work with a topic that's related to working with images, but this introduces several different topic types. The task, the procedural details, such as import pictures, where I would tell somebody explicitly how to import a picture. Concept, the background information, reasons to use pictures, where I go through and I talk a little bit about the value of inserting pictures. The reference information, the technical information, the facts, we may have a set of supported image formats that I want to explore and provide more detail on. I also introduced the idea of the map. And remember that this is where we have the information about the relationships between those topics. There's going to be appropriate metadata and optional linking and navigation built into the map. So when these tasks and concepts and references are used together in one map, they may have a specific set of link and navigation information, and that might be totally different in a different map, which is completely legit. 
I also talked about attributes and remember that this is the metadata, the background information to further define elements in each type of topic. Again, more as we start to move forward. There's a bunch of elements that you should think about before you start creating any topic. These are the types of elements that are usually considered by writers. Some of the common elements that I like working with include the title, the short description, and the prologue. Now the prologue is usually made up of information that's built or planned at a higher level than a day-to-day -day topic. It's important to have it in the topic, but it usually comes because somebody has identified a lot of metadata or background information that likely won't see its way into print, but helps to manage all of that content. Take a look at the example. Now this is from Wikipedia, and I love working with Wikipedia. I think they do some great stuff, so definitely a big supporter. The content that I have is from Wikipedia. I've exported it into a Word document, and once it was inside Word, I just deleted a lot of it until I got down to a small piece that I can use for the example here where I talk about the title and the short description. And if you look at the graphic, you'll see there's several titles. These titles set up introductions to headings, but they're also used by things like smaller sections, examples, figures, tables. So the title becomes a really important component. The short description is that initial brief statement in a topic that doesn't repeat the title but enhances the value of it. It adds more detail and is often used as something like the equivalent of a tooltip or a rollover. So if I have a link to Canada, when I hover over it, I would see the short description. When I have a link to something like Confederation and Expansion, again, when I hover over it, I'd see the short description. So it's a really important component to have. And again, I'll get into more details and show you some of these moving forward. There's also a bunch of elements that you probably use a lot. Paragraphs, tables, and inside the different types of topics you have the body. So a general body or a concept body, a con body, a reference body, a ref body, and the task body. Now most of these body elements will have a mix of things like sections and examples. You might also have cross references, lists, and the lists are made up of common things like unordered lists, ordered lists, and list items. Figures and images, a lot of things you're already familiar with, DITA supports these. A lot of the elements on the previous slide are things that you'll often see inside a section or an example. You'll see it inside topics, concepts, references. But the task body is made up of a couple of unique pieces. Inside a task, you might have things like a prerequisite. This is the information before you begin. The context. This is a bit of a summary of why somebody would do the task. What's the reason or the benefit? Some of the steps, which I'll explain in a few moments. The result, which is the net result of the entire task. This isn't what happens when you finally get around to the click save, click print, click OK. This is a larger, more involved net result of the entire task happening. An example, and try to keep it specific to the task, and a post requisite. This is something that must be done after the task is completed, but probably is more involved, could be a task onto itself. There's also steps and steps unordered. And in both cases, they're made up of one or more of the following, a command. This tells you what to do. It's a specific instruction, a call to action. Click this, open that, adjust the other thing. Info some additional content that helps the user perform the step. Don't put it in there just because it's an option. Put it in when it makes sense to give that extra information to the user on exactly what to do and how to do it. The step result would be the result of just this one step. For example, select file new. You might want to put in a step result to let the reader of your content know that the save as or the new or the open or the print dialog appears but don't put them in if it's completely obvious don't put it in there if it's something that is is known to the user as soon as they start working with the product what you might have is something like a save command and after somebody clicks save you may want to make mention of a specific result that says the document is now uploaded to the network server they don't necessarily see that happen on screen, and if it's an early task for a novice user, that might be the type of information that a step result is great for. Tutorial info is content to help whenever somebody's working in a guided environment. It's not information that you necessarily want in every help topic, 
But if you publish all of your material into some type of a tutorial, it's nice to have that after a step. So again, the steps made up of the command, do this. Additional info that may be inserted if you feel like it. And it doesn't state the obvious, but it supports the command. The step result, again, it's an optional piece, supports the command. Tutorial info, optional, supports the command. Those are the pieces that make up a step. Note also that there's something called domain elements. This is often used for words. So there's typographic, which generally should be avoided, but it's things like bold, italic, and underline, type text, superscript, subscript. The reason those should be avoided is because they're hard-coded format. Instead, use some of the semantic markup that describes the function of the words, whatever it is that you highlight. So in a programming in, uh, environment, it might be a code phrase or a code block and you can programmatically assign look and feel so that instead of just applying B for bold, you're making it into a code phrase which happens to appear as bold when it's published. You still get the look you want, but now behind the scenes, instead of having to distinguish between 800 different combinations of things that are all in bold, you can identify a code phrase or a code block or in the next column, the software related, you might decide that a file path or some user input is set up to be italicized or to be set up in a type text environment, courier font. Each of those configurations is driven by the publishing tool or the author tool. So now content is flagged as a file path, which makes it easier to find, it makes it easier to programmatically format it. You can do all kinds of extra goodies with it. The same with things like user input or a window title, the save as dialogue. Well, save as is your win title and programmatically you can drive the look and feel. So there's a lot of support for semantic markup around the idea of different words or phrases that you're going to be using on a regular basis inside the DITA world. A decent amount of discussion about some of the elements that are available, but really whenever you develop a DITA topic, it comes down to a lot of familiar things that are being done already in the technical communications environment. By and large, you write down that high level structure you come up with a clear title that introduces something. A short description, which I'd suggest is required and always inserted. And what the short description does is it provides in a single sentence, maybe two, but not much more than that, additional information that helps clarify the title. And if you set up a lot of title and short descriptions and you have things like chapter titles and heading ones and heading twos inside your document, you probably already do some of this when you build a documentation plan. So you're already in a good place to get started with the data topics. Concept task, reference, any of those, title and short description, and then if needed, some of that prologue information. And I'll give you more details on the prologue just so that you know a little bit of what's being done and why. Over time, you start to populate the specific content as it's provided to you. As you create all of these different topics, also bear in mind that there is going to be a higher level, a map, that's being used for things like publishing. So I may decide that inside my publishing environment, I'm going to create a set of books or a set of materials. They're going to start off with ideas or concepts, and then they're going to branch off into several different tasks. And that might be one way that I publish information. My content also has some appendix material for argument's sakes, an index, a, a very involved set of reference or technical lookup material. So I'm going to have all kinds of technical references with subordinate reference information. And again, this might be one way to publish, but think about your audience. I'm not suggesting audience equals gone to the dogs. What I'm suggesting is the audience could be all types of different types of users with different types of experience and backgrounds. All of these considerations come together though, and you may decide that you also want to publish online material, or heck, you may want to create a book and it has tasks. And those tasks are mixed together with things like conceptual information and subtasks, which in turn have reference information and tasks associated with them as well. All of that mix and match is possible, and each of those unique topics could be used across all of these different publishing environments. It could be used in a specific publishing environment. And the context of use will drive the appearance of headings. The context of use may drive some of the related links. The context of use drives the parent and child relationship. It drives all kinds of different things. And the beauty of this is that independent topics are written 
and can be reused across any one of these map environments. So what is it that the maps, the topics, the attributes, the relationship tables, all of these pieces mean? Let's take a look at how to build some of the outlines. Before you actually start sitting down and writing the structured content, creating your tasks and your concepts and your references, think a little bit about some of the starting points in order to develop the content. So let's start off by first looking at building some outlines. These slides that have a work in progress down in the bottom, these are areas where you may want to jot down some of your own notes, start coming up with some of your own ideas. You may want to pause after I get to the end of these independent slides and just brainstorm either as a small group or independently, depending on what environment you're in when you're watching the video. But to give some background on the planning, imagine that there's a product called the Tech Writer Tools. An email comes in from the product manager that says, we're going to need some documentation for the Tech Writer Pro. I'm going to suggest at the very least that we have a user guide that explains what the tool is, how it works, a few basic things, maybe some tutorials. This means that you as writers need to go in and do things like create the user guide for the Tech Writer Pro tool, which means you have to brainstorm and come up with an initial list of topics. And of course, I want you to think about DITA in the overall scope of the project. So if you need to, just pause for a moment, think a little bit about some of the things that go into a user guide. You don't have to put in a lot of detailed effort, just very big picture, what are some of the things that you'll need? And I explore this in the next couple of slides as well. This is another one of those work slides. You can outline the topics for the Tech Writer Pro tool. Think about your audience though. You're writing for a technical communications audience. Assume you're writing for people like yourselves. Now we know that these are intelligent, eager to learn people who are busy, open to new ideas. Basically, we are, you are the best people on earth. But this type of an audience needs to get up and running. So it's going to be task rich. Core concepts and references will be needed, but our focus is on the task. What do you do with a tech writer tool? So you brainstorm. As a group of writers, you would sit down and start putting ideas on whiteboard, text files, scrap paper, whatever, wherever. Think about the tasks that users do. Don't worry early on if some of these are too complex or too simple. Just get the ideas. And if there's a mix of concepts and references thrown in there, not just tasks, so be it. Totally legit. So again, you may want to pause the video and just sit down and make yourself a list of five or six different things that you think somebody might want to do if they're working with a tech writer tool, something like Word or FrameMaker or similar products. Now, my sample list is a little more involved. I've put together a lot of things. Hopefully, some of the ones that you've jotted down or you thought about are inside here. If you're brainstorming on tasks, you should develop a good sample. This is a relatively decent sample. Not everything in it is a task, but most of them are. Remember, this was a brainstorming type of a session. So as I sat down and started coming up with my different pieces that go together, I've added things in here. And some of them may not be day-to-day -day users, like in the second column, the first piece is make templates. That might not be something that I want my everyday user to do. On the other hand, my everyday user should be able to change font sizes or drag and drop content. But looking down that middle column, I also have a couple of things like work with clip art or reasons to use styles. And these may not necessarily relate directly to a task, but be supporting information. Again, if you're brainstorming, it doesn't matter. Feel free to make those more involved or more complex lists, but almost everything that's in here is a task. If you didn't put together your own slides, if you don't have your own material, if you didn't brainstorm with a group of people, don't worry. What I want you to think about is what it might look like when all of this becomes formalized. I had that one table of information, but over time, I take all of those individual pieces, which are tasks, primarily that I'm going to write about, and I might put it together into a spreadsheet, and I have a couple of categories. I may identify who the author is, what type of a topic it is. Now, I'm starting off with tasks, but I may also want to identify quickly that some of the information is a concept, some of it is a reference. I may come up with my title and my short description early on so that I can have a consistent grammatical style to things like titles, or I can see all of my short descriptions in one place and see whether or not they make sense when they're combined together as larger big picture ideas. 
I may also put in some notes to myself. Early on, I wanted a lot of tasks, maybe just the titles and nothing else. But over time, I start to build it up. I come up with the author, the topic type, et cetera, et cetera, based on my overall needs. I'll have more on this later. Again, I'll show you a little bit of an example of this in practice shortly. But if you want to, as part of the work in progress, you can pause, you can back up the video just a touch, you can take a look at what was on the previous table, and you can decide how some of those pieces might work in regards to having a short title, a descriptive introductory piece that's one or two sentences. The other thing that I want you to think about and to potentially jot down is how are you going to actually get your source content? Source content can come from many different sources. People that you interview, existing material, your own experience or other content that you're researching. Again, there will be more on this later, but think about this early on when you're putting together your information. You've identified your audience, you've identified your topics. You may also need to take a little bit of time to identify what the sources are that provide you information. It's not 100% related to knowing your elements, but having that information makes the DITA workflow a little easier. If you feel you're generally comfortable with some of the things so far, great. If not, I'm going to help further visualize the task, the concept, the reference, and also talk a little bit about the generic topic. These are sort of the fantastic four of the DITA world. Tasks are really one of the most important core things in the DITA model for a writer. Now, odds are people are doing things when they discover there's a need to look up the documentation. You're trying to do something that doesn't work, you go to the docs. This is why tasks are core. It's likely the very first place that almost all users go. For the non-data purist, this is the procedural stuff you look up when you need to know how. It might be used by trainers or in self-study guides, and of course it's also inside help systems. If you want to get a bit more specific, then according to DITA, the task is an answer to how that tells the user just what to do in the order in which to do it. It's step-by-step -step instructions that enable a user to actually do something. I use the puzzle representation because it's that first piece that connects to the second, that connects to the third, that connects to the fourth, in order to make sure that the finished piece is delivered. Now we're back to core elements. So the DITA task structure is made up of all kinds of pieces, but again, there's a title, a short description, a prologue, and then the body. In this case, a task body with all of its required components, optional components, things like prereq context, step result, post requisite, the option for related links and nested topics. But at the beginning and early on, you work with the idea of the title, the short desk, and perhaps the prologue. And again, I'll show a detailed example of some of these pieces in a little bit. Concepts. Now the picture here I've picked it for a specific reason. A concept addresses things when people are wondering why they should do something or the benefit. That's the concept. non data purist. It's like the good marketing material that tells you what it is, why you want it with great background information. So the concept of ice cream, it's something you eat, not something you apply yourself to your body in order to block out the sun. Now sunscreen, you don't eat. It's something that you apply to yourself in order to block out the sun. Again, for the purists, according to DITA, the concept answers the question, what is or why, by detailing information about something. It's initial information that users must know before they can successfully work. It supports the task by providing an explanation that's outside the scope of the task. A task may have a very brief context in it, a benefit, a reason for performing something, but it doesn't provide the background information. And the icon here represents people sharing ideas, and that's generally the job of a concept. The interesting thing about the DITA concept structure is that again, it starts with the title, the short description, the prologue. So if you remember what those are from the task, then building a concept becomes that little bit easier because it's reusing the idea of title, short description, prologue. The con body, the concept body, is made up of several different pieces like sections, examples, those block level elements we looked at like paragraphs and tables, phrases and keywords, images and multimedia components, the related links, nested topics. But again, the core pieces that I want you to think about are the title, the short description, and the prologue. References for the non-data purist. 
This is the techie stuff. You look up when you know the big picture, you've got the concept, you know the procedure, the task, but you don't recall the specific details. It's a little bit like somebody going in and looking up stock information to see what the current price is or what the PE numbers are. You understand what a PE number is, you understand what a yield ratio is, you don't necessarily remember all the details of the exact numbers. You know how to buy and sell, but you need that background information, that technical, very specific type of content. According to DITA, technically speaking, a reference is made up of quick access to facts, tables, lists, alphabetical content. It's something that users should be able to scan quickly and find information. It's often technical or background information. It would be a little bit like a nutritionist looking up specific calorie or fat or carbohydrate counts for very defined categories of information for given fruits, for specific vegetables, for types of meat. All of that value would be something that's looked up inside the reference. It doesn't tell you how to make a sandwich. It doesn't tell you why you need to eat fruit and vegetable because that's covered in tasks, that's covered in concepts but it gives you the specification. Again, when we look at the structure, we see a lot of similarities, including title, short description, prologue. Lastly, I'll talk about the topic. For a non-data purist, this is what you use when you can't make it a concept, a task, or a reference. It's sort of the miscellaneous, the other. It's often also a starting point for specialization, which gets into more of your geeky, specific pieces. And according to DITA, in the purest world, the topic is a top-level data element for a single subject or an article. It's the starting point for all the other base topic types, and it's only used if no other topic type applies. Generalization, avoid it. Go with a task, go with a concept, go with a reference. And again, because topic is the starting point for all of the others, the topic has that title, short description, and prologue, which is why tasks, concepts, and references start with title, short description, and prologue, common elements. Did it also supports the idea of the attributes. I talked about these. They apply to topics and they apply to most of the elements. So a lot of what's inside a concept, a task, a reference uses these attributes behind the scenes. Graphics, for example, would have a display attribute to scale up and down. Tables might be set up with an expanse to go across multiple columns. The ID attributes would be used to uniquely identify and find information. The selection attributes mean that you can identify something that is product specific, audience specific, that has a certain status assigned to it. The topic ref attributes could be used to decide whether or not something appears in a table of contents in print or in search, so that you can configure what information and what types of materials end up in your output. There's also a set of universal attributes that include all those selection attributes for things like the platform and the product and the audience, all the ID attributes to uniquely identify things, but they have settings like translate so that you can identify on an element by element level whether something should translate, yes or no, or in an XML world, what language is associated with it, which could help drive when printing, if it prints in a left to right or a right to left type of an environment, it could also determine things like date values and exactly how they're displayed in the output. So there's a lot of behind the scenes thought. Remember the A and DITA architecture, this was planned. This had a lot of smart people working on it behind the scenes. Over time, one set of elements that you'll likely get familiar with, especially in a well planned out DITA environment, is working with your prologue. The prologue contains information about the topic as a whole. So for example, the author or the subject category. It's often manually entered or maintained by some software tool automatically. So either you're doing a lot of this stuff or you're doing almost none of this stuff. It likely doesn't display in the final output and it's often used by some sort of an automated process in order to build search indexes or customized navigation. In a content management environment, some of this may also be used in order to control your information. Topic level metadata that's then available inside a prologue is pretty broad ranging, but includes things like the audience, the author, critical dates. And those critical dates could be things like the creation date or the revision date, the go live. 
Keywords, permissions, the platform that the information applies to, or the product name. Lots of metadata information that's available in order to define whether the topic, the concept, the task, the reference applies to a specific audience or an author who created the material, if it has a platform it's associated with, if there's keywords that need to be in the index. I've talked a lot about different types of elements that you use in the data world. The concept, the task, the reference. I've talked about paragraphs, tables, lists, images, all kinds of information. Imagine this as source content that somebody hands to you. It has a lot of text in it. It has some text that's in italic, some text that's inside bold, some text that's both bold and italic, but it's all manually put together. It's a little tough to identify the task, the concept, and the reference information. So let me draw a bit of attention to a few specific areas. Here I've identified some of the core task information. You'll notice in the first column that the word insert and the word image is in bold. In the second column, there's a couple words that are in italic. And on the very last sentence, it reads click on a file, then insert, which doesn't have any formatting. This might be a piece of what I get from a subject matter expert, and I need to rework it so that it meets the data specification for a task and is actually using the elements that are allowable. I now do some of the same thing for the concept. Looking at it, I've identified what are the ideas? What are the good to know pieces of information? This is background information. None of it is the task, but again, there's some words that are italic, some words that are bold, some that are both. I don't know exactly why. It doesn't matter exactly why. It's source content. Somebody made those words stand out and longer term, instead of bold, italic, underlined type text, consider using the semantic markup that identifies the purpose or the function. It's not always something that you can do. There are times where bold or italic should be used, but not as a first reaction. The first reaction to those words is to decide, is this a win title? Is it a command phrase? Is it a chunk of information that has a purpose other than it's just bold or it's just italic. Out of all of the information, I have very little that's going to be in the reference, at least initially, but I do see a list of supported formats. This one's a bit more work. I've taken the content, the source content for working with images, and I've started to rework it into a new plan. By building this table, I can look at it and identify that I'm going to write at least three primary topics, a task titled import pictures, a concept which discusses the reasons to use pictures, and a reference which is going to be a list of all the supported image formats. Each of these three topics will have the title element. Each will have a short desk, a unique short desk. Each will also have prologue information that contains different author information three different task, concept, reference elements, and I've decided to have three different authors. And in the future, I can go back and I could decide to search for information based on the author. I have my metadata, my audience, the type and the experience. At publish, I may decide that I only want to include information that's assigned to a user. Therefore, the reference information assigned to a programmer might not be included. I may decide to use this information in a content management system to filter information. I might publish a knowledge base with everything in it, but I allow people to choose a role from the drop down and they'll see different contextual information. I also have metadata information for the category. So import pictures is related to page design, reasons to use pictures is related to page content, and supported image format is related to specifications. It's a grouping. And lastly, I've also decided to include a resource ID. And this has an app name for the help environment, and it has a couple of different IDs that are going to work as unique identifiers in the help system so that each of the topics can have contextual links directly into them. All of this information is set up using the data elements, the title, the short desk, and the prologue, which I've discussed earlier. When it's consumed, my finished task might look a little bit like this. The title is Import Pictures. It has an icon so that my users can very quickly identify that that's an express task. It has the short description, 
images can be added to web pages, which means anytime somebody sees the phrase import pictures, they know that it's not a service that allows you to order pictures and have them shipped from Italy from your vacation to your home address. You're not importing pictures by shipping them from one nation to another. You're importing pictures, which means images can be added to web pages. So that short description is important. It adds context to the title. There's a prereq here. Ensure the graphics are in a supported, web-friendly file format. If you think back to the content that I initially had, this is much cleaner, easier to read. It has six steps in it, and in the output, the first step, select the location, insert an image. The second step has select image insert. Image and insert are set up as a UI control. These are specific user interface control items, and that the DITA model supports the UI control, the two of them together or in a menu cascade, and the symbol between image and insert can be automatically included at time of publish, which means that that symbol could be changed by reconfiguring one setting. And then for argument's sakes, if I wanted it to have a little arrow, a graphical representation, if I wanted it to be a pipe, if I wanted a comma followed by a space, I'd go to one configuration setting and change it, and hundreds, thousands, millions of tasks that are published against that specification would change this symbol. A tiny little thing like that with a manual process of finding and replacing them becomes a headache. There's also a continuation because in my publish I've decided to combine together the command as well as the information. And the information says if inserting a map or a chart specify this. It's a little bit of additional information in order to help the user make the decision when choosing image insert what to do. Then step three and four and five, and five has click insert. The word insert, again, is set up as a UI control. Part of the data specification allows UI control elements to be put inside a command. Here, however, it's just the word insert. In step two, there's a symbol between image and insert, because on publish, it recognized that this was a menu cascade containing two UI control. In step five, I have a single UI control, therefore no extra symbols are created, no extra content. It's only if there's two or more that it automatically puts something in between them. And then lastly, configure the image as needed. This is my task. It's much cleaner. It's written using several of the elements that I've described throughout this component. This is my supporting concept, reasons to use pictures. Again, it has an icon because on publish, I've decided to include a graphical representation this allows the user to very quickly say, this is not a procedure. It's not a step-by-step -step piece, because that's a different icon. This is a concept, an idea. It has a slightly longer short description. It has been set a picture is worth a thousand words. It explains very briefly, use images to show ideas, visualize complex ideas, or to add life to dry text. That's my short description. Somebody hovers over reason to use pictures. This is the text that would pop up in a help system. I have the word maps and I have the word charts and both of those are formatted in a different configuration because yes, I wanna draw the eye to it. And maybe they aren't a window title. They're not a UI control. They're just keywords that I want somebody to trigger off of and therefore I can insert them using a keyword function and decide to show them graphically here in bold or to include the keyword inside something like an index or a search. Yes, I could have just used bold, but again, avoid bold, italic, and underline because it doesn't define the reason for formatting words in a given way. Lastly, I have my reference. The reference is titled Supported Image Formats. The reference has a graphic. The reference has a short description. In the output, this is what the table is rendered as. It has color. It has a white text with a blue background for the heading. That's one appearance in one publish, in one map for one output type. If this was a PDF or if I decided it was going to be a different type of web content, I could get rid of the graphic that's off to the side. I could change the table configuration, but the table is made up of elements. It has things like rows. It has pieces like cells. It's set up with a table heading and the words format and function and notes have a unique appearance. It has merged cells. It has content in it near the bottom of the function that reads Adobe Photoshop or Adobe Illustrator. 
Those are specific trademarked words, so they may appear inside an italic environment. All of this behind the scenes is fully supported by the data specification using some of the elements that I've talked about. But again, you'll see there's the title and the short description and the output. All of the prologue information is hidden away at publish time so that the reader doesn't see all of the audience information. It doesn't necessarily represent who the author is, the publisher, the creation and the revision dates. That information could be used in an online environment. It could be metadata that's in the code of the page, but it's not something that my day-to-day -day user is going to ever have to look at and read. To wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about how you would develop basic content and what I would do in a classroom environment or in an environment where there's an active hands-on component. I have people build basic content. I give you the chance to play a little bit with the idea of the TechWriter Pro, the database documentation set. In order for this to work though, different people have to take on different roles. I take on the role of the dictator, the manager, the overseer, the sponsor, the information architect, the lead. In general, I would do very little, if any, work. And instead, I allow you, the participant, to take on the role of the writer, subject matter expert, the reviewer, the editor, the content creator, generally a lot of the people who are doing the day-to-day -day work on a topic, concept, task, reference type of a level. I would collaborate back and forth on ideas, but if there's an arbitrary decision that has to be made, somebody says, oh, I don't know, should we write for the Mac or for the Windows environment? I may just decide, you know what, we're going to write for the Windows environment because most of the people here work with it. Or we're going to write specifically for the iPod. We're not going to put out an iPhone version of the material. We're not going to put out something for the Blackberry version of the material. We're going to put together only the app support specific to the iPod. Those are the types of arbitrary decisions I like to make. It's not a very fair or democratic way, but the goal that I always have in this type of environment is to get a solid outline and start writing. So if you do feel like, and you don't have to, if you feel like putting together some sample material that you want to play with, I'm happy to take some time and take a quick look at it. The next component that I would do in a traditional class environment is a review of legacy content. I have legacy content. There's all kinds of material that's available on the web, but it's also interesting if you have your own material and you want it looked at because one of the services that as a business we offer is that legacy content review and evaluation and conversion in order to help put together a unified content strategy. The bad news, back on slide 28, I told you a bunch of different topics. I talked about them, I showed them. The good news, it's going to be coming up in a moment. I've put a copy of it into the video so that moving ahead, you'll see it. If you feel like doing a little bit of work in order to get your head into this space, you may wanna group and label some of the different topics that I came up with. You may wanna think about the task concept and reference. There's a lot of topics in there that are tasks. Some of them, however, may end up needing additional concept or reference information to support them. Play the role of the writer or the manager of some of the information. Come up with a topic plan. How would you take the topics, the information that you're about to see, and organize it into a map? What would be a primary topic? What would become secondary? You could decide to create a basic table with things like the topic or the file name, an expected order to it, the levels for the content, and some core metadata. You can group the information, you can put it into logical patterns, even if a topic belongs to more than one specific type. For example, you might decide insert a table as a task, benefits of tables as a concept, and table types as a reference. So be it, you're talking about tables. Build yourself a basic hierarchy. Take a look at what's available and just outline it a little bit. And again, I've got samples of some of this, not a huge amount, but some samples in the video. And again, this is slide 28. I've just put it in here. You can pause the video and take a look at it. You'll see there's a lot of information, and here's where you might want to start off by identifying tasks and seeing if there's a related concept and reference. Build it into a bit of a hierarchy. Just think a little bit about the data topics, how they might be organized. You don't have to write anything in detail, just a bit of a plan. Only a couple of slides to go. Organizing that content. One simple start is a shared spreadsheet with a couple columns where you identify level one, two, three, primary, secondary, the author, the title, and the short description. You put together one row per topic, and if it helps, you may also want to add some of that metadata. Again, I have a sample showing you this. 
you organize it using a familiar pattern. It's probably something that you've put together in a documentation plan before, and therefore take advantage of that. Reference back to the things that you're already familiar with. You'll likely come back and look at this repeatedly. In some work environments, this type of work is done by the information architect. There are also real world tools that exist to make it easier, but there is overhead. You have to learn them, you have to figure out the data spec, all of those goodies. Generally though, sit down, take the time, plan it out as if it's any other documentation plan. And again, the next slide shows a little bit of an example. Here the table's a little cramped. On the next slide it's expanded a bit, but you would get yourself source materials, whatever they are. You, you play the role of a SME and you write content. Don't spend your time editing. Feel free to add extra content if you need to clarify a point. Work without the safety net of a style guide. I'm not asking you to write crappy material. Just write quickly, make general assumptions. And again, the next slide expands it a little bit and I'll talk about the table there. What do we have? I have the idea of the elements, the topic, the concept, the task, the reference. I know there's going to be a title. I know there's going to be a short description. I know that I'll probably have a bunch of metadata. I just don't have enough room to show everything on screen here. So what I've done is I've come up who the author is, the assigned to, that's part of my metadata. The topic type, is it a concept task reference? Maybe a file name. The file name here starts with CT or R and an underscore in order to make it a little easier for me to look at a whole list of files and very quickly say, those are concepts, these are tasks, these are references. The data element, I already have my title and my short description. I also have some SME content that's been provided, and I have a couple notes to myself. This would be a basic starting point in order to see a big picture plan of all of your documentation. It is a document plan, very much hopefully like one that you're already familiar with that you've seen in the past. In this case, I've just structured it a little bit around the model of DITA. I have not put together in-depth detailed information. It exists, and so does this video, in order to get you started. This is not the be-all and end-all. If you do want more information, if you'd like to explore this in more detail, feel free to contact me. We can definitely explore it further. If you do choose to contact me, if you're watching this video, we haven't communicated before, here's my contact information. If you're watching this video in order to reinforce some of the ideas from some of the webinars and presentations that I've done in regards to DITA, here's my contact information again. Whether you're somebody I've worked with, whether you're someone who's new to me, please feel free to follow up, give me questions, set up a conference call, take the time to let me know what you like and don't like. You have different ways that you can reach me. I've got my phone number, I've got a Twitter address, I have a LinkedIn profile, but email is usually the best method of communication. Thanks a lot for looking through this. I hope the video has been useful to you. And I look forward to working with you more in regards to any of your DITA projects.